take this off. We're looking for your J1. J1, J1. J2. I want to grind that through the wood. Okay, now we're going to take this, these guys off, side pieces. Yes, sir. Alright. I'm going to put in the back pieces or the back bolts for strength. Yep, okay. and then rest it on that end over there. Set her up on the lip. You want to put the other bolt in back here? So as you can see, this first section had two legs, whereas the second section only has one, and we go down below and bolt in between together. We figured out to set them like this so that we didn't have to carry a lot of extra legs with us. Okay, so that's what it takes to set this part up. Then what we have to do for a show, underneath we have our wiring and basically it's going to be plug connections from one section to the next. Another set here, from here to another, and same thing on both sides. Two sets of track, two connections, two connections, and they go all the way around the layout so that everything is electrically functioning properly. And so, to, keep, to keep the polarity right, all the plugs are special. They're called Cinch Jones plugs. They have one large spade, one small spade, so they can only go together one way. And then all the plugs have a color code to them. They're either red or yellow underneath, so we know it's a red plug to a red plug yellow. And you can't put them together backwards. So that keeps it from shorting out on you. Yeah. So the next step for a typical show is, well, we'll stand here, but there would be a backdrop. We're not gonna put that up today, but the next section is putting the track pieces between each module. So a standard nine inch section is going to go between each of these modules here. At the show we'd have the same thing going this way, same thing going this way. This particular module has a lot of industry on the back side so there's additional sections here in track. That takes quite a little bit of time to put those in place and line them all up. 
And so we'll give a little demonstration on some of that. Now we label all of these with a letter and a number to make it easier to put it together. Now they all come out of plastic bags that are labeled for which modules they're connecting. So each of the rail ends have what we call a rail joiner, and that rail joiner will slide underneath the rail. So I'm going to take my 9 inch section here, and I'm going to put it in place, make sure I get it correct or else we're going to have a derailment. Okay, so that looks pretty smooth. Now it comes down to the other section, and that rail joiner is underneath, and I've got to slide that toward the other one. Well, we just got to do that another half a dozen times for this particular module. One of the other important things at the show is we got to make sure this is level. We got to make sure that this is a certain height off the ground and level so that as we go all the way around and connect back up to the last module coming, we want to make sure that it's not a big gap. Actually, not a gap at all. So that also takes a tremendous amount of time setting that up. Now, because we store this in an unheated building, we'll actually check it before the show to make sure, see if the wood's expanded or contracted. Like sometimes you have everything cut perfect and you think you're just where you should be, and then the wood changes. Okay, all the street sections are labeled. This is just regular sheet styrene, and to get the grooves in there, we just take a utility knife, put a straight edge, go like that so it looks like poured sections. So these buildings that were made, they're not full buildings because they go up against the backdrop. So this particular one is what we refer to as kit bashed. Club member had built this by a uh, company that makes individual wall sections and so you have the flexibility of going as high as you want as long as you want um, you can block windows in with brick or you can make them dock doors or or whatever but anyway uh, we refer to this as just as kit bashing and making your own it's your own ideas um, and it's used for again a backdrop which you now th there's a tremendous amount of bracing on the back of this because it's very rough taking these things to shows. Yeah. So to keep it from like breaking up, that's what all that extra white plastic is along the back. And what we found out over the years is that bamboo skewers make some of the greatest materials for doing that reinforcing because you never get quite square. And if you try to put a square piece of plastic there, it fights you, but the round skewers just fit right in. This is the granary. This is the uh, silos. This is the covered shelter. And again, for a show, we'd have a backdrop over here, approximately this high. It's usually going to have some, perhaps some scenery, some trees, some cloud formations and whatnot like that. And it also gives a good break to hide some of the stuff that we have behind that uh, during the show. Now these are old modules. They're about 20, yeah. well, 23, 24 years yeah. old. And we've changed some of the way we do this. One of the things we do now is instead of having a three and a half inch front here, we go to six inches, make the legs pivot so they hide up inside the module so we don't have to carry them extra. What we've done over the years is as we got older, we tried to make this simpler to do. The other thing is, we look for a lot of ways to do stuff that's cheaper because if you buy everything done, built, it's a very expensive hobby. Bill was pointing out about the, this being a kit bash building. This company actually will give you a paper template 
with every one of their sections on it that you're allowed to Xerox and then you just cut it and match it until you get what you want and then you know what parts to order. And this is how it goes together. This is one of our big questions. We developed our own levelers for this. And we, all we have to do is put a, the drill on them and we can raise it up and down and you can raise it very easily. They used to just have a bolt into it and you put a wrench on it and one guy would lift it a little and you drop it another bit. This way is quick. Yeah. So if we wanted to raise or lower, it's just a matter of doing that and then locking it into place once we get it there. Again, from a time frame standpoint, someone is walking around with a very large um, metal ruler that we have, making sure it's at the right height. Another with a level, making sure it's level both this way, both that way, and then continuing around our circle, or excuse me, our oval. It doesn't take much of a grade to really degrade the performance of the locomotive. Yeah. The flat just works better. And the biggest thing is keeping it level is, if you're not keeping it level, yeah. you can have an inch difference. The and then you have to go back along the whole thing and re-level it. But once you have it level, it, it, it's just amazing what a little locomotive will pull. Now it takes us, what, about three hours with the leveling? Yeah, the whole, the whole process, the whole setup, about three hours to set up. 45 minutes to take it down. <laughs> And it's just the reverse. Every, everything we have either has a cover that fits over it. Bill has covers on his because his buildings are permanent to his yeah. modules. These, we just have the end plates and put it all together. Little different uh, building skills and designs over the last 20 some years. So some are easier to, to handle, some are easier to store, some are easier to set up. We've learned a lot. One, one thing about being in a club, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn carpentry, yeah. you'll learn electrical work, you'll learn electronics, yeah. you'll learn the scenery, the painting. You, you learn how to buy good wood. <laughs> That's very important. Sometimes if you can't get regular wood that isn't bowed and stuff, we cut these long pieces like in the front out of three-quarter plywood. It's uh, got to be sanded more and stuff to protect us from slip splinters. But uh, it's, uh, when you go down to buy wood, it's amazing the dips and turns and stuff that it makes. And we seal all this stuff. We put a two to three coats of a waterproof sealer on it so that once it's built, it stays in that position. Because on some of the module pieces that are six to eight foot, they'll have extra braces underneath to help keep that stability. The two by four ones, you get good wood, you don't have to worry about it. And all this stuff is built to the National Model Railroad Association standards. For instance, the main lines are five inches and seven inches from the front of the layout. You can do anything you want. If you have two modules, you can make the track drift wherever you want. But when you come to the ends, you got to go back to that five and seven so that it'll m match the next modules. A truly modular layout, just people do whatever they want on each module. We've developed into a more sectional thing, as you would call it, so that the scenery and stuff sort of blend together. Because like we went to a, a branch line. These are considered mains. This is a branch. The branch is 10 and a half inches from the front. So anybody who wants to build it, like you can do a lot of what we call switching. We're actually delivering boxcars, moving them around. So we have to have that 10 and a half inch standard for that branch line. Because you can operate the branch line independently of the two mains. And that's how we put it together. Okay, this is a material that we use for cleaning track. Even though this is nickel silver track, and we use nickel silver because it doesn't oxidize as badly as its forerunner. They used to have brass tracks. And you go to a show anymore and you'll see guys with piles of this trying to sell it. The problem is it oxidizes almost as quickly as you clean it. But cleaning this is really simple. We just get a little on the rag and you just go like this across the track. You don't push too hard because you don't want to disturb the stone underneath. And you can see 
there's a streak on this already. Most of the times when somebody comes up and they say they're having problems with their trains at home, it's either the track's dirty or the locomotive wheels are dirty. You've got to keep them clean so you get your electrical connection. And you just go down the whole track like that. You just back and forth. Some people use alcohol. The problem with using alcohol is that it'll disturb the glue that holds the stone down. So you have to be really careful you don't get too generous with the alcohol. And that's how we clean the track. So one of the questions we get at our club is, how do you build the scenery? So on this small display here, I'm going to describe from the very beginning to the ending part here where we have it fully scenic, and then I'll go into describing how I make some of these trees. So at this end, we have your basic track and cork roadbed, which is on our entire layout for the whistle club. Uh, what I'm demonstrating here is that after the roadbed was put in place at a certain height, what's underneath that? Well, I applied some screen over just some crunched up paper just to fill the space and create some contour. Then I put on some uh, plaster of Paris cloth, which is, comes in rolls, actually the same thing that the doctor's office would use to cast up a person. Uh, basically, what it, you, you get those wet and you simply apply these two and then you start to smooth them out. After they dried, I put a little bit more plaster of Paris or I could use some uh, spackling or drywall paste, whatever you want. It, it really doesn't matter. I end up putting that over there to make this a lot harder. Then eventually you have to paint it some uh, earth tone color. I use green in this case. And then you come across where you start to put on your ground uh, foam or whatever material you like. This particular material here is just the fines from uh, peat moss. Uh, you, you buy that at the greenery store, um, k and get the real fines at the bottom, and so then I applied that here. I applied my first coat while the paint was still wet. It usually doesn't grab as much, so then you would put some glue over that, some diluted glue or other sprays to hold that in place. Uh, the next part of it here, I'm trying to show this little bit of a river creek scene. And so I've got my um, rack work underneath here. These come in plaster castings. You can buy those or you can make them yourself. They make rubber molds that you can pour that same plaster in. And so you can get all kinds of sizes and textures and designs that you want. And of course, then you can paint them whatever colors you want. Um, so. I ended up just painting this here creek, kind of a gooey green. Um, but then I ended up putting a little bit of a water finish, another product that the manufacturers make to simulate water, to give it a little bit of a shine. Throw some details in the side as far as sand and, and logs and things like that. And then as I moved over onto this side, I started using some more ground foam from the various manufacturers to simulate different colors of your grasses and some bushes and weeds and things like that. I came over here on this side and I actually ballasted my, my track. I actually painted that track too because the railroad ties change color over time. Some of the newer ones are usually a, a darker black and as they fade they turn into a lighter gray. So there's multiple colors of ties in there put my ballast down there to secure the track, and then I started building some trees. These trees here are called pepper grass. You can get those at the florist. They come in a variety of colors. Uh, one thing nice about those for our modules that tend to get moved around a lot, they're very flexible. You don't always want to do that with some of the other ones because they'll break, but these are very flexible. This last tree here is uh, sedum, and that's what I'll describe in my little seminar here as far as how I make a tree out of sedum and the various materials. So we talked about making trees out of sedum. This is a very common plant in our area. Um, I have several sedum plants throughout my property. As I've been walking around during the COVID to get my exercise, I see them at the local bank, our library in town. They're really quite common. The best thing about sedum is during the summertime, um, 
they are, this is the flower of the plant. As it dries out through the winter time, then you get a nice dry tree substance to start with. Um, so if it's in the winter time and you see them, now's the time to pick them. They do come with uh, a lot of other little leaves and flowers underneath that you end up having to pick off. It's a very fragile plant, so you can't be uh, too rough with it. But if you look at that, it's a tree that's been shaved up. Well, that's not all that natural because if you really look at the forest, you look at the trees, there's a lot of branches throughout the whole thing. So I'll end up grabbing some other pieces and getting them not necessarily the same height, but just to try to fill that in. And so these are some samples here that I've grabbed. And I'm just going to cram them together. I'm not too worried about the color. Some of these have dried in little different colors. That's okay. But uh, once I get that into a shape that I'm comfortable with, I am going to then say, okay, that'll work for now. I've got some more to do afterwards. But regardless of that, then I'm going to grab a small piece. I should have cut this first. This is florist tape. It's similar to masking tape, except it doesn't have the stickiness. It's got a little bit, kind of like a stick of itself, but it stretches nice. So the challenge is to get it started. And then you stretch it and just simply spin it. And it will hold its shape. There you have it. So that's my starting point for this particular tree. Um, I did grab one more. Where is it now? Perhaps this one. A lot of times in the forest, obviously, trees die over time. This particular one here would make a very good dead structure. I would just pick off some of the top flowers, and I would save this one here to plant somewhere in my forest, perhaps pull it together to mimic a dead tree. So just because they don't have the top to it doesn't mean you need to throw that away. Okay, so the flowers on top are what's going to hold my scenic material in place. These are common products by probably two of the key manufacturers who make these. And really what it is is just a ground-up foam of different color and different texture. One of these, uh, they relate to it as green grass, and this one is spring green grass so a lighter color. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some glue, diluted glue on top of this, and then I'm going to sprinkle this on there, and then we'll let that set. I'm using standard Elmer's glue here. I diluted it to three to one, and I'll pour that into here. There are other products. Matte Medium makes a very good product. This is a little more flexible, um, whereas White glue when it dries is real hard. Doesn't really matter for what I'm doing here. I happen to have some of this already pre-mixed from a previous project, so I'm just going to pour this in my cup here. Make sure this doesn't come all out at one time, so stir it up a little bit. What I end up doing is, whoop, looks like I made a tree too big or I brought it too small of a bowl. But either way, what I want to do is I want to get that diluted glue water solution to get into the tops of this soon-to-be tree. And I might break off a few pieces along the way. That doesn't really matter. My intent here for making these trees is to really make a forest, so I'm not too concerned about the rest of the structure down here. I just want to get it to be thick on top. And what I do is sprinkle some of this on. And you will find, obviously, that a lot falls down onto whatever you're working down below. I will pick that up, and I will press that into place. And then I will set this off on another spot and work on another one. I just have a piece of insulation board here that's easy to push in. Eventually that glue is going to dry, but it's not going to 
adhere to everything on there. And I might want to come back and add another layer or perhaps a different color because not all trees are the same color. It might be the same tree, but you'll find uh, um, different variations. And that could be from perhaps cloud cover, shadows, um, just a variety of things. Not all trees are the same color green. So this is, a, <coughs> excuse me, this is a finer detail. And I could sprinkle a little of this if I wanted to dull something down or, or again highlight or change color. That particular green is similar, so it might not be picking up too well. But when I'm done, now I want to put another adhesive on there. And what I have found, this is a spray adhesive and this is a pump adhesive. I would not use this unless you're building trees in the summertime because it does have quite a bit of odor and it's not something that you'd want to use inside. You want good ventilation for it. So I just use a standard, uh, my wife's, un well, she uses, it doesn't matter. I use a unscented hairspray is what I use. Only on trees, as you can see, I don't need any hairspray. So I would put a little bit on this. Sure, I don't get it on everything else, but just simply spray it on. And you can do this in multiple coats. Again, if your layout is at home and it's not going to be moved, chances are you don't need a whole lot on there. But in our club, it gets moved around quite a bit. I ended up putting several on there. So I've made various different sizes because as I'm building a scene, I want to start in the back and I want to put in, again, this one, I'm really only interested in the top of the tree. If I have a scene that I'm building and I want to put other trees nearby, I'm going to put them in. There's my dead one that would be nearby. I want to start filling in this space so eventually I have some trees in the front where, in this case, I have built them up a little thicker. I've painted them. and put some more detail because that would be some of the things you would see first, whereas these other armatures of the trees are going to be blocked by the tree in front of it. So you can kind of, you can kind of cram them in there. So when I built up my forest on some of my other scenes, I kind of start out the high and I bring down to the front. One thing nice about sedum is there's big pieces, but you can get all the way down to the small ones, actually all the way down to the bushes. I can, I can clip this off right at the ground level and I can put that all the way into my scene whereas basically you'd be looking straight up. So next time you're, you're driving around and you're seeing trees off to the side, take a look. You'll find that it really starts from the ground level and goes all the way up unless you're in a park or something like that. <laughs>